Hello, everybody. Welcome and good afternoon. That's, good morning. Good. good evening, wherever you are tuning in from. Uh, my name is Hala Alawi, and on behalf of Atmosphere Press, I am so pleased to welcome you to today's event, Studying Society. We'll be hearing from Davidson Lore, reading from Hollow Gods, Why Liberalism Became a Destructive Religion, released June 13th, and J.D. Taylor, reading from Hair Goes History. Hair enhancement has shaped the arc and trembling hand of history, or excuse me, how hair enhancement has shaped the arc and trembling hand of history, released on June 27th. Both books new this year. All of the books can be purchased both from online retailers and from select bookstores. And of course, the books can be ordered from Atmosphere Press's website at atmosphereprescom forward slash books. I'm going to go ahead and drop some direct links in the chat as well. At the end of today's event, we will have time for audience questions. So during the readings, if you have a question for one or both of our authors, go ahead and type that in the chat and I'll make sure it gets asked. And then during the reading itself, please be sure to stay muted just to keep extraneous sound at a minimum. Of course, you can always feel free to use the chat for any praise and comments. And one last note before we get started officially, we at Atmosphere Press appreciate your support today and always. If you have a manuscript of your own, we would love to read it. So submit your work today to books at atmospherepress.com. Again, thank you so much for tuning in and supporting Davidson and JD today. We'll start off with our first reader, Davidson Lore. A Vietnam veteran, Davidson completed his degree in music theory at the University of Michigan, an MA in methods of studying religion, and a PhD in theology, philosophy of religion, philosophy of science, and Wittgenstein's language philosophy from the University of Chicago. A retired Unitarian minister and a fellow in the Liberal Jesus Seminar, Davidson wrote the chapter, the Nature of Humans, Science, and Religion for the International Big History Association, or the IBHA, title, Science, Religion, and Deep Time, published 2022. Today, we'll be hearing from Hollow Gods. It's a text digging into the ties between politics and religion in the American political system. In this book, Davidson, who has been called a combination of Khalil Gibran and Dr. Phil, brings a much needed clarity to the reasons that liberalism has done such deep harm to areas including education, the media, politics, race relations, and religion. So now we'll hear from Davidson himself. Oh, Davidson, you'll just wanna make sure you're unmuted first. So it's the, at the bottom left of your screen. Who did that to me? All right. Hello, and it's nice to be a part of this Atmosphere event. My newest book covers half a dozen important areas in our society today, all related to how and why contemporary far-left liberalism is doing so much harm to virtually everything it touches. And I say this as a lifelong liberal. So in these few minutes we have together, I want to give you an overview of subjects so important, I think everyone in America should read my book. And isn't that just what an author would say? While it involves education, the media, liberal racism, politics, and religion, the real origin and center of the far left's dysfunction is its secular religion. You may never have heard that before. That's where it started and where it's still struggling and causing so much damage to our society. So let's start there with the origin of our leftist ideology, our far leftist ideology. About two centuries ago, as our sciences began developing, liberals began sloughing off God, heaven, the Bible, and all supernaturalism that we could this is hardly a secret, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. But with what do you replace heaven, for instance? With what do you replace the idea of living eternally 
in some magical heaven? The answer virtually all atheists drifted toward in the 19th century and today was to replace the heaven up in the sky with the utopian socialism or communism here and now. This is not a new insight. I cite a book published in 1850 and still in print by French scholar Frederick Bastiat, who saw all of this as it was happening. Karl Marx's book, The Communist Manifesto, had just come out in 1848, but Frederick Bastiat's little book titled The Law saw the pattern in many places. When you think about it, creating a utopian socialism would require at least the wisdom of an omniscient God. So now, with what do you replace God's wisdom? Well, for two centuries now, liberals have replaced this God with ourselves. We believe that only we have the wisdom and the vision to create this earthly utopia. We're sure of this, but nobody else respects that opinion. So we seek, as we have always sought, power. If we can get the power to rule, we can command the respect that we can't earn. That's really a horrible admission, isn't it? Add these few things together and you have the vision that has hypnotized liberals at what we call the far left for almost two centuries. It's the dream of a totalitarian socialist or communist utopia. It's worth remembering that the word utopia was coined by Sir Thomas Mann for his 1516 book of that name. He made up the word from Greek word parts, and the word utopia simply means nowhere. We need to remember that more often. The reason it must be totalitarian is that the ignorant masses, those, those are the deplorables in the flyover states you've heard of, they don't have the wisdom to construct this utopia, and they get in the way of what we like to think of as a parental government, where we are the parents. We treat you to a utopia, and you have to obey us. Sound appealing? I bet. Today, many people describe it as Marxist socialism or Marxist communism. Democrats know that the word totalitarian doesn't play very well, so have often instead called it one party rule, same meaning. We want to pack the Supreme Court so it can never contradict our ideology. We want to add Washington DC and Puerto Rico as strongly democratic states and change whatever laws are needed to keep conservatives from ever again gaining political power. Now consider education. One brilliant insight that probably no one has ever heard of, I'd certainly never heard of it, one brilliant insight has given liberals control of all of our education. Few people know that the insight came, I'm not kidding, came from Tom Hayden, the California congressman who for 17 years was married to actress Jane Fonda. Hayden was, was a college student at the University of Michigan where he was editor of the Michigan Daily, the school's first rate newspaper. He was a leader in the SDS movement founded in 1960, but the SDS movement really descended from an older movement called the Intercollegiate Socialist Society founded in 1905 by four quite famous men. Uh, two writers of a uh, lawyer, and what's the other one? And, uh, oh, and a journalist. Upton Sinclair, Walter Lippmann, Clarence Darrow, and novelist Jack London. Tom Hayden practically defined the new SDS movement in a published statement he wrote in 1962, called the Port Huron Statement. And he said that they needed to control the entire US government. They would do it, he said, by completely controlling all education for college students and for children K through 12. Now at the time, the SDS movement had fewer than 200 members nationwide. 
So this absolutely sounded insane. But then the 1960s just exploded with the anti-Vietnam War movement, movement for women's rights and black power, as well as a growing distrust of our government. And by 1968-69, just six years after Hayden's statement, the SDS membership had increased 20-fold to around 40,000. Now, suddenly, Hayden's idea became practical. Within about a generation, Hayden's plan had succeeded. How do you show that? The ratio of liberal to conservative professors in U.S. colleges had increased from the three to two in 1969, the year I graduated from University of Michigan, three to two, to about 13 to one today. In some fields, like communication and journalism, a major study found that in a group of the top colleges in the country, there were 108 liberal professors and zero conservative professors. That's why the media are overwhelmingly liberal and anti-conservative. They are now taught that there aren't two sides to the most important issues. There's only one side, the side dictated by liberal ideology. The other side, the conservative side that taught is wrong, the enemy, evil, needs to be silenced or destroyed. Does this sound familiar? Ask a college student. Ask how many conservative speakers are shouted down and forbidden to speak. That's not education. It's indoctrination. It's a terribly important point. Now we come to what I call liberal racism. Most people today don't know, at least I didn't, didn't know, that in the 19th century, see if you knew this, all slaves were owned by Democrats. The Democratic Party was the slave-owning party. They didn't see Black people as real people, but as things that could be used to serve the white Democrats. The Republican Party was formed in 1854 as the anti-slavery party. And, and of course, our first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, signed the Emancipation Proclamation, freeing the slaves and also planting the seeds for the Civil War and for Lincoln's own assassination. In the 1964 presidential election, Lyndon Johnson realized he could get more black votes in the South than he could get white racist votes. So for the first time in a century and a half, this liberal wooed Southern black voters and ignored the white Democrats. He won, but he also acknowledged publicly that he had lost the South for the Democrats. Those angry white Democrats changed parties and became angry white Southern Republicans. But what didn't change for the Democrats was their view that black people were an inferior race whose only function was to be of use to white liberals. And all of this is still present in what I've called liberal racism. Black people are used as tokens to let liberals feel virtuous without really helping black people much at all. There are a lot of books by good black authors on this. You can see Jason L. Riley's book where the title is Please Stop Helping Us, How Liberals Make It Harder for Blacks to Succeed. But there are a lot of other really good authors on the subject, too, including Shelby Steele, Walter E. Williams, Bruce Bartlett, Brett Easton Ellis, Heather McDonald, John McWhorter, Candace Owens, Thomas Sowell, and many others. Now, let's consider politics. Democracy in the U.S. requires two parties not the one-party system Democrats want. The reason for this was articulated clearly, almost poetically, by John Stuart Mill nearly two centuries ago. Here's what Mill said. In politics, a party of order or stability, today we'd call it Republican Party, conservatives, 
and a party of progress or reform, the liberals, the Democrats, are both necessary elements of a healthy state of political life. It is in a great measure the opposition of the other that keeps each party within the limits of reason and sanity. Where there are no right of center voices to keep the left healthy, the result will inevitably be a much more extreme and self-indulgent political culture. Where there is no opposition, leadership will flow to the most extreme and exciting positions of the left. That is, to its least defensible versions. Wishful thinking can then proceed without check. The exclusion of their intellectual opponents dooms both parties to incompetence. A kind of intellectual laziness can set in when everyone agrees. Scholarship becomes unreflective and imprecise in doctrination. So two centuries ago, John Stuart Mill foretold our future just precisely. Democrats are now closer to their totalitarian dream than ever before in history, and they will do anything to achieve it. Lie, cheat, kill, anything. Do not underestimate them. Now consider religion. This also takes us back to 1962 and to someone you may never have heard of, but one of the most powerful minds in the whole story. The man's name was Maurice Strong. He was a Can Canadian raised in a powerfully socialist family. He skipped four grades in school, so he was one of those rare people who usually was the smartest person in the room. As a young man, he became convinced that it was time for the world to be under the command of a worldwide totalitarian socialism ruled by the United Nations. One head of the United Nations even suggested that we think of the UN's relation to the nations of the world as we think of the United States' relation to the states. That's powerful stuff. Strong didn't know how to take over the U.S. without an army until 1962. That's when Rachel Carson's book Silent Spring came out claiming that DDT was poisoning our water, air, plants, fish, and humans. Our government has since funded a multi-million dollar scientific study showing that DDT is quite safe and is easily the most effective destroyer of the Anopheles mosquito, which causes malaria. Carson was no scientist and had even been thrown out of a master's degree program in science told that she couldn't think like a scientist, but she was a very good writer. And suddenly a whole army of environmental activists came to life, insisting that all countries, but especially Africa, stop using DDT. They even told African countries that they would make sure no other country bought any of their exports unless they stopped using DDT. So they did. The latest figures I've read say that over 100 million Africans have been killed by malaria since then, more than half of them children. But the activists are still proud. Maurice Strong realized that he could use activism as a form of mob rule to help destroy the culture of the United States. And it needs to be destroyed to help us degrade ourselves toward socialism. In liberalism, secular religion, environmental activism, I think, is a lot like the evangelical fundamentalism of Christianity. Their activism is their salvation, and they act that way. While there's much more, I'll conclude this as I concluded my book. Please be clear, I am strongly against socialism. One study says that the various socialisms of the past hundred years have murdered over 170 million 
of their own citizens. I understand the logic of that. They have to do it, but it's evil, it's wrong. Still, I'll leave the last words to the voice of the far left liberal activists, socialists. They want to say that the story ends with two facts. We won, and for the next generation and a half or more, you're screwed. The end. Thanks. Thank you very much, Davidson. Up next reading is J.D. Taylor. J.D. is a former high school adult education and college adjunct history instructor. He has published articles and letters in major newspapers, you're, magazines. You're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. Is, is my audio still coming through? Anyone in the audience having trouble hearing or is it coming through? Okay. You're coming through loud and clear. Okay, great. Thank you. Just yeah, no, double check. <laughs> um, all right. So continuing along with JD's bio. Um, JD has published articles in letters in major newspapers, magazines, and won a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Humanities. JD received a BA from the University of Maryland, an MED from the University of Virginia, and an MA from Georgetown University. JD is a veteran of the 82nd Airborne Division and a former court-appointed humane investigator. JD has published two other books and now lives in Alexandria, Virginia. From political leaders like Hitler and Lincoln to cultural icons like Elvis Presley and Brad Pitt to media personalities like Don Lemon and Joy Reid, Hare has played a crucial role in the ascent of many well-known figures. Today, we'll be hearing from Hare Goes History, a testament to the enduring impact of Hare on history and challenges traditional historians to examine the role that Hare has played in shaping the grandeur of the past. So now let's welcome JD. JD, you can go ahead and unmute and start your reading. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Davidson. I enjoyed your, uh, your excerpt. Uh, my book, Hergo's History, is unique. It's never been a book published like this in the history of mankind. It's entirely different. It uh, covers 5,000 years of history. And uh, I'm simply going to uh, read my preface, epilogue. They're both short, but tends to frame the book in the context. But before I do it, I want to acknowledge it took a lot of people to help me. I didn't do this all by myself. Three people in particular spent years helping me. The late Joanne, who was 90 years old, typed my manuscript with one eye. Before she died, she said, I hope I see the book before I die. The book got to her a week before her death. Joe and my best friend, he helped with the research. And then, of course, there's Amy. She carried the baton for two years in this marathon. She's a computer wizard, an excellent editor, even though she's from Thailand. English is her second language. In essence, there would be no book or no Zoom without this five-foot Asian tiger, Amy. So thank you. And thank Atmosphere Press for giving me an opportunity. I'm going to start with the preface, just kind of give you an overview of the uh, major themes of this book. In general, my raison d'etre is to help the purpose of the universe. That was a quote from George Bernard Shaw. And I say, but in particular, my interest is to transport the reader on a historical journey, never taken before in the history of mankind, never. My inferiority complex, my fear of failure, my feeling of unworthiness, and above all, my own struggle with hair enhancement put me into this historical venture. Jolted by the Catholic event of November 8, 2016, I witnessed a diabolical manifestation of a left-parted orange hairpiece surfacing as the next president without savoir faire of the United States. 
then crushing reality set in, their systems have had a momentous repercussion on the dawning of human history. Now, the uh, epilogue also continues the uh, framing of this story. Nearing the end of this historical trek, the author came to terms with his tactile sense, realizing that democracy, the rule of law, the free press, losing the threat of truth and a more perfect union, were all being suffocated by the January 6, 2020 cult of insurrectionists. Akin to the epic journey of Satan in Milton's Paradise Lost, who wanted to establish an earthly empire, or the wanderings of Odysseus in the Odyssey, who was on his way home from a protracted Trojan War, favors this author's course of travel, ending in a cathartic flash, no longer feeling the sting of being worthy or inferior. The next terminal target of my story is to sidetrack the cultish juggernaut, the next president, and science in 2022 diverted by a hair's breadth, <laughs> the burning vapor of an asteroid. And the back of the book has been reviewed to you, and that's important in terms of uh, history as a powerful force that shapes our identity and understanding of the world, as eloquently stated by James Baldwin. I'm challenging traditional historians like John Meacham and Michael Beschloss to look at history from the standpoint of how hair has impacted. Now, I will excerpt a few paragraphs from a chapter or two to give you a further understanding of what this book is about. This comes from the latter part of chapter three. It was Max Factor, a pathfinder to the modern hair business who crafted a variety of styles used by Hollywood types, such as Alan Ladd, Henry Fonda, Humphrey Bogart, Rock Hudson, Jimmy Stewart, Burt Lancaster, John Wayne, Cary Grant, <laughs> Randolph Scott, Audie Murphy, Jim Arness, Dennis Weaver, and many more. They all wore styled hair systems by Max Factor. And of course, I start chapter four, and speak about Dr. Norman Orntreich, founder of hair transplantation. And I discuss in the chapter the details of how this works. And then there's another chapter that I think is very important here, another excerpt. I'll be speaking of uh, presidential hair, this is my last chapter. And we go back to Abraham Lincoln. We could talk about uh, the modern presidents, such as John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy only beat Richard Nixon in 1960 by one fifth of 1% of a vote. And that was votes helped created by Sam Giancana of the Mafia in Cook County, Chicago. Kennedy was described as a handsome debonair uh, individual, as compared to Nixon at the time, being sweaty and having a shadow, so to speak. But John Kennedy was wearing a not a very good hair system in those days. He would never become president of the United States or beaten Richard Nixon without that hair system. That's the point that I'm making in this book throughout the history. And that is followed by Ronald Reagan, the Bushes, both Bushes, Jimmy Carter, Bill Clinton, and of course, Donald Trump. And so I would excerpt this chapter, uh, the ignominious and most bombastic of all hair systems belongs to Donald Trump, prevaricator and buffoon. 
Trump suffers from male pattern baldness, known as androgenic alopecia, which affects men and women. And um, Beta Smith, uh, Will Smith's wife, speaks about her shame concerning her alopecia. Trump was the Humpty Dumpty of the dumbed down Republican Party of 2016. Trump cannot tell the truth on any issue. Truth does not change, quote unquote, said Giordano Bruno, who died in 1600 by Otto de Fe, burning alive by the Catholic Church, burning him alive for telling the truth. A Gawker investigator <clears throat> received information that Trump's hair is not his own. According to Ashley Feinberg of Gawker, quote, Donald Trump's hair, this was May of 2016, Trump's hair is a $60,000 weave patented by Edward Avari. The Avari microcylinder technique is known, he is also known as Muhammad Ali Avari. It is a micro uh, uh, cylinder technique which deals with weaving. Avari was championed, has championed himself as a doctor and a pioneer in hair restoration. According to Gawker, Avari has no medical credentials. He uh, had centers located in New York and Los Angeles. His license was suspended in 2015 because he was a tax dodger like his rich clients. He promoted his speciality in New York Magazine between 1995 and 1997. The New York office of the Avari Institute is located on the 25th floor of Trump Tower. Briefly stated, the microcylinder technique is a weave. It's focused on placing natural hair strands through tiny cylinders until the desired effect is reached in terms of thickness, style, and um, length. This is non-surgical, of course. In 2000, Trump ordered his stylist to color his eyebrows and hair a cigar-stained teeth blonde, according to Celine in Vanity Fair, September 2015. The microcylinder cost technique starts at uh, around 60000 with maintenance fees ranging from $300 to $3,000 per month. The microcylinder weave can be shampooed, tugged at, showered, combed, and styled in any direction desirable. Prior to the Avari method, Trump wore a normal standard hair system. <clears throat> That's one of the uh, main points of my story here, this project. Um, if the media would expose Trump's hair system, he would cower in a shed like a frightened animal. He would never show up in public. If you want to get rid of Donald Trump, expose his hair system. That's the essence of my one of my stories here. And I would conclude this monstrous project by a few words and the afterword, which I think is far more important than Davidson's book or my book or any book in the world. I start the afterword with a quote from Shakespeare. One touch of nature makes the whole world kin. I'd be remiss to end my story by saying, a reader's aim and not pull the fire alarm about climate change. Miracles violate the laws of nature, said David Hume. He didn't believe what he couldn't see. Everyone can see what mankind has done to the, our planet. The destruction is ubiquitous. It will take a miracle of some kind to salvage what is left. Man must attack climate change like a piranha on flesh before it's too late. The Earth's circadian rhythms must be stabilized.
And I go through all kinds of facts and figures and conclude this story or a paragraph saying nature is the garden of love implied by William Blake, the poet. He said, quote, where so many sweet flowers bore, end quote. Galvanic teenager Greta Thunberg personifies the beau ideal of an environment, environmentalist by declaring her love of nature before the world. Quote, love recognizes no barriers, it jumps hurdles, leaps fences, penetrates walls, and arrives at its destination full of hope. End quote. Maya Angelou. Over 200 years ago, John Keats's Ode on a Grecian Urn inspired this law. And my final comment, there's none so blind as those who will not see Jonathan Swift. Thank you very much. Thank you, JD. Um, at this point, I do think it's a great time for us to get into our audience Q&A. So we've got some time for this Q&A. So if you've got a question, go ahead and type it in the chat and I will make sure it gets asked. I have already been receiving some questions directly messaged to me. I also had some people email some questions into Atmosphere before the event even started. So there's a lot of interest in hearing more from both of these authors. Um, but go ahead and drop any additional questions anyone has, and we can jump right into it. So this first question is for both authors. And this question is, what was the process of writing these books like? What was the research process and then the writing process like in specific? Uh, Davidson, do you want to start us off with this one? Oh, Davidson, I, I believe you might still be muted. The mute oh, button. Yeah. Okay. It really sneaks up on you. <laughs> it does. Uh, I read over 50 books for this, and, and it was all during the COVID business when I had a lot of time to read books. And it seemed like what I thought were simple questions got more complex and broader as I got into them. So I wound up reading books on a lot of topics. Um, I say in the book that it was a painful book to write because I've always been a liberal. Um, I've grown away from it in the last 10 years or so. I'm still quite liberal in religion, but not in politics. Um, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm attacking the democratic thing because I'm a liberal and I think that we ought to attack our own people first. I'm not a Republican. I I like to find out where the facts are and then try to make my beliefs harmonize with the facts. So that's why I was interested in history and all that kind of stuff. I, I hope that addresses the question. It was a good question. Thank you very much. Um, JD, what about you? What was the research and writing process like for your book? Well, I'll tell you, it was, it was, it was, it was hard, difficult. I went through four years. I suffered through rotator cuff tears because I'm a weightlifter in the gym. I'm, I had all kinds of uh, lymphedema problems because I sat too long, never getting up. Uh, the uh, the process was difficult. It was, I, I wanted to quit several times, but my friend Amy said, no, stick with it. This Asian tiger kept me going for two years. She spent hours helping me with editing and all this kind of thing. And uh, I, <laughs> I didn't know if I'd ever finish, but we did. And the editing process was difficult, even though we had professional editors from Atmosphere Press who are very good. Uh, it was a difficult, difficult project, which took a physical toll on me uh, uh, to this very day. But uh, 
it was something I felt I had to do that no other historian or person ever attacked the history as I have, and it's relevant, most relevant today. So I hope the right people are listening because it's necessary to look at history from a different point of view and how important it has been to shape so many people who've made it to the world stage. It truly seems like a, um, a book that takes a village kind of aspect. So definitely interested to hear about that. Um, we have a question that is particularly for Davidson. This person says, um, I'm interested to hear more about your background in religion in particular. Why did you decide to study it? And how has your relationship with religion changed over the course of your life? Well, there's a question. Um, hmm. This answer will be a little longer. I was through with religion when I was six. I uh, I loved Sunday school. We had a wonderful Sunday school teacher. And by that, I mean, she was a great storyteller. She loved stories. She loved children. And every Sunday, we went to that little room and she told us stories. Now, probably they were all from the Bible. But I don't remember ever hearing that. I just love the stories. One day I went and she was gone. No one told us why. Did she die? Was she fired? Did she move? No one told us. But in her place was the evil demon soul-sucking witch lady who seemed to hate stories and hate children. And what she was trying to teach us was theology. And we thought it was a story, because that's all we'd ever heard in that room. But it was a really stupid story. It only had three characters. It had God, and God lived in the sky. And I thought, well, Superman's up there, and Captain Marvel's up there. That There's got to be room for a God. That's fine. Then God had this kid named Jesus. Well, we had a big color poster right on the wall of Jesus sitting there, being surrounded by six-year-olds telling him stories. So Jesus had been vetted. He was fine too. But then there was a holy ghost. I thought, are you kidding me? The only image I had for a ghost was Casper. What a stupid picture. So when she finished the story, she asked if we understood. I thought that was dumb. And I, said, I was trying to be polite. And I said, well... I think I think it was a good story, but next time, leave out the ghost. She went ballistic. And she told me that Jesus doesn't like little boys who call this a story. And I said, well, then leave out Jesus. That was the last time I ever went to that Sunday school class. When I got home, I was I was very angry and very confused. And my dad asked how church was. Uh, and I said, not good. And he wanted to know why. So I still remember vividly sitting on his right knee, asking him, he asked me why it was bad. And I said, she told us this horrible story. And he said, did the story have a name? And I said, yes, she called it Trinity. He said, oh, I know that story. His father was a Presbyterian minister. And I said, all right, you tell it. It's got to be better. He told me the same damn story. Exactly, including the ghost and the guy in the sky. And I remember looking at him and with my little innocent six-year-old voice, I said, Daddy, you don't really believe that, do you? And he said he did. I was through with religion that minute. I was through with it forever. When I was 20, 21, I attended a Unitarian church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, it was the biggest Unitarian church in the country, which is kind of odd to find it in Tulsa, but it was because of the preacher. He was a, an amazing preacher. The sermons were honest, they were relevant, they were challenging, comforting, on and on and on. And I went in and see him and had several interchanges and we developed a good relationship. And I liked John. Um, after a year and a half in Tulsa, I wound up enlisting in the army for reasons that are a long story. When I got out of the army, when I got back from Vietnam, I was a combat photographer in Vietnam. I was really kind of lost for about 12 years. 
I played in music and realized I didn't have a gift in it. I opened a high priced photography studio. I was good at that. But after six years, I was bored, so I sold it. I learned carpentry and photography, carpentry and did that and thought that's not a career. And I was just lost and finally found a psychologist who worked with people in their mid 30s considering a career change. I thought that was a pretty funny hobby. And I was 35 considering a career change. He gave me a lot of tests and I took them and he said, well, your interests and aptitudes line up with people who are successful and happy in eight different fields. And I thought, no, I want to know the one, not eight damn fields. And he said, well, there's never going to be one. He said, you're all over the board. You're always going to be. So he said, my advice is go through these eight study them and see which one, if you could really do it well, might be the most fulfilling. So I looked through them and I'd done most of them, photography, bazaar, carpentry, and teaching, and so on and so forth. And then I saw ministry in there. And I thought, you've got to be kidding. I was through with that crap when I was six. And then I remember John, the preacher in Tulsa, who was good. And I thought, well, if you could do it like that, if you could be that good, yeah. That could be fulfilling, but I didn't know anything about religion. So I called John on the phone and I told him I was considering going into this racket. And he said, uh, why? And I said, well, it seems to me that if, if ministry's done well, if religion's done well, it could answer what I think are life's two most important questions. And he said, what are those? And I said, um, the first question is, who at my very best am I? Because that's who I damned well better be becoming. And the second question is, how should I live so that when I look back, I can be glad I lived that way? And John said, well, he said, those that do. And I said, yeah, the problem is, I don't know anything about religion, and I hate being ignorant, and I don't want a seminary degree because those are all confessional. You go to a Methodist seminary, you're taught to think what Methodists think, or Catholics, or Unitarians, or whatever. I don't want a seminary degree. I need a PhD. Where do I go? Where is the best school in the country to get a PhD in religion? And John said, yeah. is Tulsa draw? Well, he said that had to be the University of Chicago. And I said, honestly, oh, I said, I didn't know Chicago had a university. And there's a pause, and John says, Jesus Christ. Then he said, I'll tell you what to do. You call information in Chicago for the University of Chicago. If it exists, go there. So I did, it did, and I did. It was a superb school. I had a superb teacher, and it was the religion was honest all the way through. It was relevant all the way through. Uh, it was certainly life-changing. And I loved my seven years there in the graduate school for the master's and doctorate and my 23 years as a minister. I'm sorry the answer was so long, but you shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> it was quite a journey for sure. <laughs> um, and thank you for sharing. It with us. Um, the next question that com has come in is for JD in particular. Uh, J.D., have you ever considered publishing some kind of article in a peer-reviewed journal or something similar on the topic of your study of hair history and hair culture? Not quite I heard, uh, understood what you said. Sure, I can repeat it. This person would like to know if you've ever considered publishing an article similar to the topic of your book in something like a peer-reviewed journal or an academic journal. Oh, I say yes, yes. Uh, that's a very, very good question, and uh, I have not considered that. I, I, I'm so, so wrapped up in this uh, project for so long. I've been exhausted, and uh, no, I, I hadn't uh, considered that at all, uh, but I should. I agree. Thank you. Maybe something uh, in store for the future, then. All right. We have another question. This is one for JD. Again, 
JD, you've published two other books before Hair Goes History, as it was mentioned in your bio. Were they similar in theme or style to this book? Huh. Entirely 100% different. The first, the first book was on Vietnam. Uh, it was called uh, Beauregard Canine War. It's about a true war dog. I went to Vietnam as, a, as a, the, I think, the only Doberman that ever went to Vietnam. Uh, I knew his handler, and um, uh, it, it's a story about this one particular 120-pound Doberman and the people around him. Uh, the book was published in London in 2017. Uh, it's uh, as, as, as one of my friends, uh, Ingrid, uh, read the book and one Sunday called me with tears in her eyes and said, thank you for the story. Uh, another friend of mine who's uh, an author, a poet, he said he's a slow reader, but he said he read Beauregard in one day. <laughs> that was the first book. Second book was uh, a memoir about my life in Japan as a child under General MacArthur. I was an occupation child. Mm -hmm. Uh, my father went to, uh, we went to Japan uh, shortly after World War II. Uh, he was at the 7th Division, Entry Division, and I was a child then and lived in Japan during the Korean War. And many uh, weird experiences at that time as my mother was dying with spiomeningitis and my father was on the way to Korea and my brother and I were left alone in uh, Honshu, or Jin, it's Camp Jinmachi, which is central Honshu. So I lived through those three or four months uh, pretty frightened as a child. And that book uh, is about uh, my life in Japan as a child under General MacArthur as a great man. Uh, those are the first two and uh, that I uh, have done. And uh, the MacArthur book, by the way, is in the MacArthur Memorial Library, I'm told. Yeah, so kind of a pivot to this um, book following those, but definitely, you know, using the same kind of nonfiction category. Um, the same person actually has a similar question for you, Davidson. They said, you wrote a memoir before you wrote Hollow Gods. Obviously, these are two quite different genres, although, again, they are both forms of nonfiction. So they'd like to know, how was writing the two books alike and how was it different? Boy, actually, I have two books prior to this. Um, my first one from 18 years ago was just a book of sermons. And the title was um, America, Fascism, and God, Sermons from a Heretical Preacher. I was always a heretic. And the second one that came out in 2021 was a memoir uh, called Stories of Life, the nature, formation, and consequences of character. And so it was about that. And a lot of stories, I'm really built of stories. Gosh, more than a third of the book are the stories of my 43 months in the army, uh, including my 53 weeks in Vietnam. And, and I, you know, JD mentioned Vietnam. I, my last seven months in Vietnam as a combat photographer were sacred, and they're still sacred. That sounds like a funny word for it, but they were sacred. I wouldn't trade them for anything in the world. They weren't pretty, but they were sacred. Um, but it was just a memoir. Yeah, very different than this. Okay, good question. Yeah, great. So lots of different uh, facets to both of you. And of course, we've heard from two great books today. So I just want to say thank you to both of you for being generous with your time with us today, with your words, your thoughts. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience for joining us to celebrate these two authors. Don't forget that you can order both Hollow Gods and Hair Goes History from the links in the chat. And please also consider checking out atmosphereprest.com to browse our new and forthcoming releases, to sign up for our email newsletter, or to submit a book manuscript of your own. You can submit your work to books at atmosphereprest.com and let us know that you attended today's event. We'll look forward to hearing from you, but other than that, that concludes our event today. So have a great rest of your weekend, everyone. Thanks.